Philippa, thank you, and thank you, David, for that uh, rousing speech. And uh, as we turn our minds to how we can catalyze community and catalyze communication, I can't think of anyone better uh, than the man who is beside me now. Just very quickly, at the, at the beginning of May, I got in late to a conference in the Royal Albert Hall in London, 5,000 people there, and it, the, the entire hall was a buzz with talk of a speaker who had mesmerized everyone. It was not an easy audience. Uh, his name was Johannes Hartl. Uh, my wife, who is just brimming with common sense and uh, not, not, not uh, inclined to the philosophical temperament like, uh, like her husband, uh, was uh, just raving about Johannes and his ability to communicate crucial ideas that have consequences. Uh, and uh, we're just so fortunate to have you with us, Johannes. Let's just start by asking you um, how it is that you would go about distilling that better story. Uh, you've been doing it for many years now. You've built up a physical community, a house of prayer at Augsburg. But you're also creating digital catacombs, as it were, through your influence uh, online and on YouTube. Let's just start with that, how you distill the better story, and then how, you dis how do you disseminate it? For me, it's like three sources. The first one is I live a life of contemplation. I try to spend many hours a day in, in silence. And I think uh, best ideas are born out of silence. The second thing is I work a lot with young people. I communicate basically to millions of people. And I learn a lot from the reactions over the many years. And then the third is, come, given my tradition, I live out of those biblical stories that have founded our culture. That's my three sources. But those biblical stories are not terribly fashionable, last time I checked. Um, there are some people here, uh, this chap at the front, I can't remember his name now, uh, who, 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 ha who do seem able to communicate these, these, these dusty old fashioned stories. But, th th but there aren't many of you, so how do you do it? I try to speak like a normal person. I see, it, it, it's, it's sometimes funny, uh, as soon as somebody starts to speak about re religion, philosophy, people, stop speaking normal. Mm. I think coming back to normal common sense issues, I think there are certain questions every human being has. And if you start with those and you actually make sense, mm. people listen, even young people do, even in the digital age. And those questions might be questions to do with, with meaning, yeah. uh, who am I, yeah. the nature of what it is to be human. But these are, these are contentious questions. These are questions that or should we say rival narratives are trying to own. Uh, we, have, uh, we have, should we say, a rainbow narrative, which has a very distinctive conception of uh, what it is to be human in terms of uh, chosen identity. Um, we have older narratives in sort of maybe a crescent narrative, a, a civilizationally confident uh, uh, Islam. Um, so how does, one, uh, how does one articulate, I suppose, less fashionable narratives. How does one go about that? There is a saying that somebody wrote on a wall, Jesus is the answer. Then somebody wrote below, yes, but what was the question? <laughs> so whenever you want to bring an answer, make sure you understand the question. Mm. So what is the question people actually are answering? And then you might humbly suggest one possible answer, because it's just one possible. We are, we are living in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pluralistic society, which is wonderful. We cannot go back to, there is only one narrative. This day will never come again. Mm. We need to humbly suggest one narrative. And if this is beautiful, if this is coming from the heart, and people feel if it's coming from the heart, then it will be attractive. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest Christian minds of the last hundred years is a, a son of Bavaria. I'm thinking of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, and he used to talk of the dictatorship of relativism. Yeah. And uh, this, was, this was the great challenge, so that even if you were to humbly put forward your, your option, your take, your perspective, isn't there just a danger that uh, you get the big Lebowski reply, which is, well, that's just your opinion, man. How do, you reply, how do you reply to How do you say, actually, no, this story may be, humbly, this story may be a universal story that has something for everyone? Truth, beauty, and goodness radiate. They have a force in itself to convince. And if we live accordingly to that, it will attract people. People are not stupid. 
And I think the posture of humility and of love actually means I, I don't have to convince you. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Even if you don't take anything what I'm saying, see, I'm not converting. I'm not trying to convert anybody. I think this is a posture of love to say, I'm just communicating what is on my heart, what you take out of it. See, millions of people watch my YouTube uh, videos, my channels. Many people write stuff like, oh, that was really a good video. At the end, when you started to speak about God, this was nothing for me, I'm not religious. And I always reply, well, thank you for watching the whole video then. <laughs> and by the way, the algorithm will keep bringing all my videos into your newsfeed for the next two years. So. <laughs> I mean, no, honestly, I'm, I'm absolutely okay with somebody. I'm, I'm just, somebody saying, I'm disagreeing with you in 10%, but we're having a dialogue, which is wonderful. One of the ways I know that you've done this is, is through a recent book of yours, Eden Culture, uh, where you talk about the ecology of the human heart. And you use a, an idiom and a language that I think really resonates, particularly among the young, among, among the Zoomers, but to advance some, some quite ancient wisdom. And, and it's had a huge success, I know, uh, here in Germany. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came to get that book going, what, how, how the ideas began to marinate, and what you were trying to achieve with it. Well, I realized that for most people, and especially for, for the conservative ones, it's much easier to say what you are against than mm. what you are for. Mm. So we all know we are against, you name it. But we are living in an in age of ecology. And the ecological movement was very successful in telling one big story, there is a planet worth saving, right? But we forgot one thing, and this is we as human beings, we are part of nature too. There is something like a human nature that needs protection as well. Mm -hmm. And if we reduce, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and we don't make that up. We don't construct the physical nature, neither do we construct a human nature. We don't. So there are certain things that need to be preserved, and I boiled it down basically extracting ideas from the word picture of the Garden of Eden. I don't care if you believe if there ever was something like a paradise, but a Garden of Eden, a story like that, um, shows us where our desires actually go towards, which is a garden is not a jungle, there's structure. A garden is a place of community where people would meet, even human beings and God would meet, and the garden is beautiful. Eden can be even translated as beauty, and I believe Order, structure, meaning, connectedness, and beauty are the three main ingredients for the soil of the human heart. And if we live, let's say, green and we save the planet, but we lose connectedness, meaning, and beauty, we go extinct too, but just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> So, Johannes, at the heart of what's happening at ARC is, is not just a stress and an elevation and a celebration of human dignity, but also of human freedom. But that word freedom can be understood in, very, in radically different ways as a kind of um, hyper-liberal way of understanding it, whereas really just freedom to do absolutely anything I want. And then there's a more ancient understanding of freedom that I know that Bishop Barron at the ARC conference last year stressed, that really freedom is, is about to be free to do what I ought to do. Tell us a little bit about how, is, is that a way in for young people? Uh, to, to talking about freedom as a sort of a yearning for freedom and then trying to recalibrate it in, in ways that in, along sort of the more ancient paths? Chen C is overwhelmed by too much freedom. And they realize if you're free to do whatever you want, at the end of the day, you're not free anymore to want what you want mm. because you're addicted to stuff. Yeah. Right? If you're free to take heroin, afterwards you're no longer free not to want heroin again. Therefore, freedom cannot logically be construed as a negative freedom, an absence from rules. So the Aristotelian way would be a freedom of, a, of an acorn is to grow out into a tree. It's not the freedom of a tree to be cut in half. Right? This would be the, the, the end of the freedom. Right? Mm -hmm. So. I, I do believe, especially Chen C, is more open to an orientation towards a freedom to actually do the good. 
And I think we need new forms of communication to bring that across. This will sound very different from what it sounded 20 years ago, but I, I think, yes, this is possible. I think especially with Gen C, it's even easier. That's just great. I, I, we've got to get you over to Cambridge and I, to speak to my students, because what, what I find among the young people in sort of my, my circles, in university circles, is that they, they have exactly that notion of freedom as, as just um, anarchy, as just mere, mere possibility, which they get from uh, certain continental philosophers like uh, Sartre and Heidegger, where it, to be free, I'm, I'm just so free that I'm, I'm free of all of the possible bonds that I came into the world with, I'm free from my family, I'm free from bourgeois constraints and so on. And there's another narrative which is to say, well, we're not free at all. We're just mammals. This is the kind of Darwinian story. We're just determined to do whatever it is our genes uh, uh, or our biophysical forces constrain us to do. So there's, there is this sort of strange um, split in those, the, the conflict in those two stories. Sure. They both, both they're believed at the same time, but not the, not the older one that, uh, that you're doing so well to, uh, to recover. Um, so tell us a bit more about community building. You've got um, the House of Prayer at Augsburg, and then you have a a growing uh, digital platform, a digital presence. How do you, and there must, now you're very well known, a lot of people want to, a lot of people want to talk to you. How do you manage that? How do you um, build a community that, that, that feels like a community where fellowship is possible rather than it just sort of turning into a big, a big unwieldy database? You have to be rooted somewhere. I'm married, I have four kids, which is part of the root system but also that faith community. I mean, actually, they see if I show up at 8 a.m. 8 in the morning for morning prayer or not, and that keeps me from flying away. I find it very, very healthy. That's, mm. Some of the people are right here in the room. I think you need something where you're rooted, but then we have to learn how to build digital communities as well, because nowadays we, we live in a virtual space. I think it's possible to do that. Mm. We, we use all the different means of, uh, of, of digitalization, but... I, yeah. Mm. yeah. We were talking earlier, Johannes, about um, the need for kind of cultural manifestations and yeah. symbols and sort of moments that, that crystallize a message, uh, often more effectively than any, than any book or podcast or YouTube video could do. Uh, often other narratives are very, very good, other movements are very good at those cultural manifestations. What do you think they might look like within the context of Ark's better story? It needs to be more modern. It needs to be innovative and creative. Conservatives are not good in being creative. I mean, I love being in a place like that. I'll, full stop, <laughs> all right? But what, what I try to do as well, we do conferences up to 12,000 people that are super modern, mm -hmm. where actually people from the secular world who do big conferences, they travel to, to study how you do the best lightning shows and stuff like that. It's super modern, super beautiful. We have to learn to speak the language of beauty and of excellence mm -hmm. in this cultural moment. I love the classic music, but nobody listens to classic music. So we have to create new music, new forms of, of manifestations. The 68 sexual revolutions, they not only had the Frankfurt School and all Adorno, the thinkers, they also had Woodstock and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Who is Woodstock and the Beatles for us? Mm -hmm. We don't have it. Yeah. So we have to create fresh, modern cultural expressions. Mm -hmm. So what we do in our smaller conferences called Eden Culture Conferences, we bring in architects, um, philosophers, psychologists like Christian Bachmann, he's for us, uh, let's see. So, and, and we celebrate a lot. There is a lot of champagne there. We smoke cigars and we have, we have a lot of fun because we have to bring back the taste of life, mm. not just speak about it. Mm. The fullness of life needs to be seen in touch. Mm. That's wonderful. So it's really something to strive for and, and very, very difficult to imagine what it might be like to be a conservative progressive, but I think you've shown that it's possible. Uh, bringing ancient wisdom uh, to uh, cocktail parties with lots of champagne and, and <laughs> cigarettes. And this, this conservative progressive thing is interesting. Yes, we were talking about this yeah. earlier. Can, yeah. you, be, can yeah. you be both? I think you can. I, I think we are the first culture that drives a wedge between tradition and innovation. Innovation always was using the best practice from the past and making it even better. Yeah. Even architecturally, we are the first nation, uh, the, the first generation to say to be innovative means to cut off everything that's old. 
And this is a stupid idea. I think innovation means to, to live in the current flow of taking the best from the past and be super innovative as well. So you don't have to choose. The conservatives always look at the, in the past. The past was not better than the present. Mm. We need to be future makers and only people who have hope lead. Yeah. Whoever bring hope. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I, would, I would go as far as to say whoever brings hope leads. Can also lead in a bad direction, you know? Mm. Yeah. But well, we have to bring hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, hope that's, that's, and hope is always has to be prospective. It can't, otherwise it's yeah. nostalgia, it's a kind of eulogy, an obituary for a past that never was. I was just thinking as we were talking about these themes earlier but, but before, the, um, but before the meeting that uh, if those of you who've ever come in on the Eurostar to London at um, St Pancras Station, I often wonder what it would have been like to step into that station, I can't remember when it was built, around about 1870, I think, out of a lot of the... Um, the, the scientific uh, geniuses that David was talking about earlier, but it would have been extraordinary. You'd have stepped into that station, and it looks like a cathedral. It's huge. It's overwhelming. It feels like Westminster Abbey or St. Paul's. It feels ancient, and yet it was what it was doing. It's, it was housing the most cutting-edge technology uh, we'd ever seen. Uh, this housing machines that could now get me to Edinburgh in six hours' time, and that's that wonderful conflation of the past and the future that is, draw is drawing on the past, but it's looking towards the future yeah. uh, with hope and optimism and, and, and a sense of genuine progress. Um, Johannes, thank you. We've got a few minutes for questions. If I may, I could just collect three questions. Let's start with three. Maybe there'll be time for more. Um, please keep them uh, brief, and, um, and then I'll put them to Johannes, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Who's, uh, who would like to go there's, first? There's one last thing that I'd yes. like to add as Good. well. Good, okay. Yeah. Uh, after the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, lady over there. Yes. Thank you. Just very simply, how do you create digital communities that thrive and that are alive? Good. Uh, gentleman down here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. So question on how you form digital communities. Yep. Um, so my question would be in regards to um, having, like, missing, having faith in, like, a new generation of architects and how to bring back maybe the idea of beauty back into, and, um, yeah, Good. how to progress. Beauty in, in public buildings and, uh, yeah, and gentlemen over there, just on the aisle, uh, 10 meters back. Thanks, Amy. Uh, rebuilding civilizations. Uh, I don't think we've heard very much about welfareism. Uh, today at all, but in terms of uh, roots of civilization in Europe, can you say a thing or two about monasticism and the role in which it has uh, given to uh, Europe being what it is, or certainly what it was, right. just uh, call it yesterday. Thank you. Well, it's a nice and easy one to end with, um, <laughs> uh, but actually also one that Johannes wanted to speak to too. So let's just take the first question, shall we, about how do you build digital communities? First one, people in the digital world are not interested in you at all. They are there to be entertained or to learn something, and if you provide something people actually find useful, the algorithms will reward you. So you have to totally think from the consumer perspective. Most people don't do that. Second thing is, you have then to actually interact with those people. You have to talk to them, you have to speak with them and learn from them. And then the third, this is the more complicated one, you can don, then Invite them to a next step. The question always is, what is the next step? You want to send an email newsletter, or you invite them to a real-life meeting, or a Zoom conversation, or a WhatsApp group with a, a daily reminder. That's how you build a, a great. And then the second bridge. question about beauty in public buildings and architecture and, and check out check out the architecture rebellion movement. They are doing a great job in this direction. Mm -hmm. We are working with them. Architecture rebellion. It comes from, somewhere from Denmark or so. Yeah. Yeah, and there's an exciting movement in America and, and in the UK as well, actually, the building create streets and so the on. The monastic. And the monastic, the uh, monastic revival. When Jordan spoke about sacrifice being the foundation of our culture, I was deeply moved. Yet, yet, if sacrifice only is something that we do and achieve by ourselves, we are still in the framework of technocratic 
human empowerment. I, I don't think that this is what Jordan means, but our culture was not formed on 1800s enlightenment ideas, but it started with one sacrifice of one person dying on one Roman cross. And this sacrifice gave rise to a movement of sacrifices actually of martyrs mm -hmm. who died in this region, still under Roman, in the Roman Empire. And it was the monasteries that actually took what was good from the Roman Empire, collected yeah. all ancient literature, what we still have today, was brought by, uh, to us by the, by the monastic movement that the monks, they did actually two things. They prayed a lot and they worked a lot and the third thing is they educated people, and they actually shaped Europe. Mm. And there is one thing that I would wish to warn us, which is pride. Um, this continent and all the beauty of the Western civilization was not created by humans who thought they got their act together, but by humans who believed in the spiritual world. And there are spiritual forces that cannot be thought away, and they cannot be worked away. You might not believe in that, but those people who built that, that society definitely believed in that. And they prayed and fasted and actually asked God. And I think this posture of humility, which for me is the definition of prayer, is the foundation of a healthy culture. I want to end with the word picture of Eden again. Culture is a garden. Kolere means to tend for a garden. Mm. Well, what is a garden? A garden is plants. And how is a plant planted? Jesus says that the seed actually needs to die in the soil. This is the ultimate sacrifice of giving yourself completely away. And only this will produce fruitful future with a human face and a future of a culture that actually is good, true, and meaningful, and beautiful. Johannes Hartl, thank you.